Good morning. Um, it looks like some of you must not have taken the subway to get here today because you're on time. And, uh, and it's very beautiful, so we're fighting two challenges today. Um, I'm Scott Kennedy. I'm Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies, and uh, we're delighted to have this China Reality Check Series uh, program for you today on uh, state-owned enterprise reform, uh, which is one of the biggest topics facing uh, China today, and it's one of the biggest topics facing the global economy today, because as goes China's SOEs, so goes the world economy. That's a scary thought isn't it? But it, it's, it's more true than it's ever been because if you look at China's economy, um, it runs at different gears, has different components, um, and the state-owned sector is, faces a lot of challenges. I just returned from Beijing last night, uh, participated in the innovation dialogue component of the US SNED. So I'm running on fumes, um, but uh, the rest of the SNED, you probably saw the outcomes as they were announced yesterday. Uh, and the issue of state-owned enterprises and overcapacity uh, featured centrally in the few days running up to the SNED and during the SNED as well, and were uh, featured prominently in, in the press as well in the discussions on uh, particularly the steel industry. Um, we're delighted to be doing this program today in collaboration with um, the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS, uh, and uh, we just uh, finished a breakfast talking about uh, commodity markets in China, and now have this public event uh, to look uh, at SOE reform, which to some extent will focus on commodities, but, but not entirely. We hope it'll, it'll be much broader ranging. Uh, our featured speaker today is Michael Kamasarov, who I'll introduce in a second. Uh, and then uh, he's, he's going to make a presentation, and then we'll be joined on stage uh, by three commentators, and I'll introduce each of them uh, when, when we get to that section of the program. Uh, and they're going to uh, add and co comment on, on what Michael has to say as food for thought, and then we'll open it up to uh, the floor for comments and, and questions. Um, I've known Michael for about a decade or more now. Uh, he is one of the most insightful people uh, who does uh, research, writing, and, and commenting on uh, the Chinese economy. Uh, he worked at Rio Tinto for many years, uh, and after that then had his own stint in a Chinese state-owned enterprise uh, in the late 1990s, uh, China Non-Ferrous Metals. Uh, and then, uh, in 1999, he started his own uh, advisory firm, Urandaline, uh, which uh, is one of the best places to go to understand how China's economy works. Uh, but not just China's economy, given his deep knowledge of uh, the technical aspects of, of commodities and metals, uh, and his understanding of global markets, combining that with his uh, deep knowledge of China, uh, he really is a powerhouse, uh, and in addition to that, he's, he's one of the funniest and nicest guys you'll ever meet as well. So, and, and that, that's, a, again, a, a, a fantastic combination. So he's going to uh, talk to us for a, about 20 to 25 minutes or so about state-owned enterprise reform, uh, and then uh, we'll uh, bring in the commentary, uh, and then and bring in the conversation with all of you as well. So please join in me in welcoming Michael Kamasarf. Thank you, Scott, and your colleagues here for inviting me to talk today. My presentation is going to be in two parts. Um, the first part, I'm going to uh, talk about the issues that are going to influence the restructuring of China's state-owned enterprises. And in the second part, I'm going to apply some of the conclusions derived in the first part of the presentation um, to, the non to China's metallurgical industries. Um, the work is part of a long-term studies I've been doing over the years on China's metallurgical industries, particularly the, the aluminium sector. And I think it's, it's a useful case study because many of the people of influence today who are, who are managing the policy in relation to SOEs, for example, uh, Xiao Yacheng, um, head of SASAC, was formerly head of Ch uh, Chinalco, and the policies enunciated there I think give you an insight to the way he's thinking. Um, 
I think one of the first issues that I've, I've come to is, is, is uh, no, no, go back. You, you jumped about 20 slides, I think. Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, I think one of the things that I've come to as a conclusion is that the, the state-owned enterprises in China have two, two roles. On one hand, they're commercial actors who are, who are custodians of state assets and they're there to, to maximise the value of them. And, um, and, they, and on the other hand, they're, they're also uh, political agents who use the same assets to uh, advance the uh, national interests or national welfare. Now, this next slide that I'm going to show um, is a, a statement from the, uh, uh, a filing by China Southern in, uh, with the US Securities and Exchange Commission. A lot of other, or any other uh, SOE or its subsidiary that has securities that trade in the US issues very similar statements. Um, I think this next slide shows you uh, a more recent statement, uh, in, also in relation to China Daily, that gives you an indication of the uh, pervasive influence the party has over uh, state-owned enterprises. Um, it, it's interesting, the, the, the interchange between government uh, and the companies that they supervise, and also the approval process for new leadership in a, in a, in a publicly listed company is first approved by the party. I think um, uh, despite the, the fact that China has embraced many aspects of, uh, of, of capitalism, it's still a one-party Leninist state. And I, I make that not in a, in a judgment, uh, I make it as an, as an observation. And under that system, the, the party controls uh, the appointments to a number of, of, of key positions, and it does, does that by it has a list of positions and potential candidates for those positions. And the potential candidates are, regu are regularly uh, assessed uh, according to what I regard as fairly subjective criteria, uh, uh, party loyalty, ideological purity, etc. And that those files are used when the party evaluates or, uh, or selects people to take particular roles in, in, um, uh, in, sta in, in state-owned enterprises and other aspects. And, when, right, and the, so the talent um, need to get very good uh, assessments if they're going to have a, 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 a rapidly rising career. Um, I think it's the, the dual objectives of maximising economic returns, and, and I have no doubt that state-owned enterprises uh, actually seek to do that, um, and implementing party policy that's seen as the reason SOEs are less efficient than their private sector counterparts. And, and, this, and the, the, the solution, most people believe, is the, uh, is the drastic reform replacing the government, government ownership with um, profit-driven private investors. This approach was taken in the 1990s when Gironji started to uh, uh, sort out um, uh, the SOEs and, and put them under severe uh, competitive pressure with the expectation that they would improve their performance. However, after some initial success, this, pro this methodology or approach was terminated. Um, it it, it uh, fell into disuse and in fact, I think the global financial crisis of 2007 forced Beijing to have a re-examination of, of its use of, uh, of markets as a force for sustaining growth. Um, for many years, the SOE's uh, reform remained dormant, but in the uh, plenum of, uh, third plenum of 2013, uh, the Central Committee raised expectations, uh, next slide, uh, oh, go back, yeah. um, ra raised, uh, next, raise expectations, keep going, Next, after that, after that, there, uh, uh, raised expectations that it was going to use the market to reform SOEs. Uh, uh, the, a lot of SOEs would be turned into joint stock companies where the government and private investors would share, share um, uh, holding, uh, share uh, interests, that um, uh, uh, professional managers would, become, uh, would come in and they'd be remunerated um, uh, accordingly. Um, I, 
Uh, and, and others have gone on and said, in a, a, allied with this is the current uh, um, anti-corruption crusade in China is part of a, a forerunner of this reform because it's designed to, uh, to clear out people who are likely to, uh, to object and, and derail the reform, the reform process, the, the powerful interest groups. I've got to say, I, I'm not certain um, that I agree with these conclusions. I see a more authoritarian and nationalistic China that is more concerned in terms of SOEs with creating global national champions. Uh, champ uh, companies that can match it with global, with transnational companies on the international stage. Um, and, I, and my view here is reinforced by, by a, a a belief that China at this stage does not do, wants to do everything it can to, to avoid large-scale unemployment. Um, next slide. Um, my um, scepticism uh, or, or, of, um, is, uh, is heightened by some statements that have come out of uh, uh, party leaders and out of the party itself uh, that the SOEs are an important process for deepening reforms and that they're not planning to uh, relinquish control of, of SOEs. And without relinquishing control, then there's limited, limited influence a financial investor uh, can have in, in, the, in the running of the SOEs. Um, even Xi Jinping himself has, has referred to the uh, SOEs as an important foundation of Communist Party rule. And um, uh, last, the year before last, he, he talked of deepening reform of SOEs as a, as a major task, uh, uh, which, which is not to be weakened but strengthened. China's, uh, the lead China's leadership's enthusiastic support for stronger SOEs surprises many Western observers who have uh, al almost an instinctive hostility toward uh, state involvement in, in the economy and believe that markets and, uh, and not government should be the ultimate arbiter of, um, of economic efficiency. And, and in this um, perspective, it leads to the, a, a popular Western belief that as China's economy grows and becomes more complex, they will become more like us. And, and I don't believe that's that, that to be true. Um, but it's, uh, 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 and, and the contrary opinion uh, to, to the popular Western belief is widespread in China, that, that there is a greater acceptance of government involvement in, in, um, in business, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, natural uh, monopoly um, uh, services such as uh, power and, and utilities. I think... Um, China's economic success over the last three or four decades has confirmed to many Chinese that uh, multi-party politics and limited government participation in the economy are not necessarily essential for sustained economic growth. And again, the global financial crisis, I believe, was a tipping point in this, in, in this that the Chinese started to believe or understanding that um, or question that man, uh, radical uh, market uh, reform um, was not necessarily the way to, do, to go. My, uh, it's clear uh, from as far back as the 2001 party 10th uh, uh, five-year plan that the preferred method for reform of SOEs is going to be aggregation or consol consolidation. And it's interesting that earlier this year, uh, despite objections that they would create harmful monopolies, the uh, uh, approval was given to mergers of a number of SOEs in telecommunications, railways and, and shipping sectors. And, and these SOEs had, had been actually created back in the, in the 90s when Zhu was trying to create competition. To be successful, consolidation needs to introduce uh, efficiencies that are not readily available to the individual SOEs. You know, one is economy of scale. Um, my, certainly in the metallurgical industry, uh, scale is not a problem and many SOEs uh, uh, suffer from. They've got the largest metallurgical plants in the world. Uh, other possible um, um, uh, improvements, uh, efficiency improvements, are the sale of unprofitable subsidiaries and retrenchment of surplus employees. However, uh, these are two areas that I believe Beijing has placed off limits. Um, 
uh, Xiao Yacheng, the, the current head of SASAC, has, has referred to uh, that uh, radical restructuring is not going to be at the cost of social stability, that uh, workers' rights need to be protected. And he's contrasted today with back in 1990 when there were large-scale layoffs and unemployment. He said China is now a, wealthier, a much wealthier country and can protect the rights of, of workers. We don't need to do it. And Li Keqiang recently uh, said superfluous workers must be transferred to other jobs instead of being laid off. And you can see here that there seems to be a conflict or, uh, or, ra or some ambiguity raised by these statements against the, the use of the market uh, to reform SOEs. The sale of unprofitable assets uh, has, has also been vetoed by Beijing. And that's because uh, in the past corrupt officials uh, profited from the sale of, um, of state-owned assets, which they sold to related parties at below market value. Now, uh, in, in the current anti-corruption climate, that's going to be a harder, harder to convince anyone. Nobody's going to put their he hand up and say, I've got one to sell. Um, and also because a loss-making enterprise will tend to be worth less than its, than its book value. So, so to dispose of these is going to be a, a lot more difficult. I want to talk a little bit now, uh, these some broad principles, go into um, uh, the aluminium sector. And I'm going to discuss uh, Chalco, the Aluminium Corporation of China, and its list of subs subsidiary, uh, uh, Chalco, uh, um, Aluminium Corporation of China Limited. Chinalco, I'm sorry, is the parent. Chalco is the listed subsidiary. Um, I think these, these um, SOEs on the next slide are... are um, have very sorry go back um, uh, have very similar characteristics to many other SOEs you know they've got privileged access to things like electricity and the raw materials needed to make to make uh, uh, aluminium for many years uh, Chalco had the exclusive rights to the vast quantities of bauxite in China um, I, I'm going to talk about the use of uh, of uh, SOEs as vehicles for state poli national policies uh, later on, when I talk about how how Chinalco was used by the uh, by NDRC to make the bid on Rio Tinto, um, and uh, um, the whilst there are independent directors in the listed entity, uh, they can always be outvoted by the state. Look uh, on this next slide. Uh, these are some of the conclusions that I've I've come to in my uh, examination of SOEs. Um, Reform has been an ongoing exercise for, the, for, for good or bad since the uh, since 48, 49. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, there were major changes to the structure of state aid enterprises, um, and so it's not nothing new. It's a continually ev evolutionary process. Um, I think uh, Tiananmen Square and the GFC were, were major tipping points. Tiananmen Square. Um, stop some of the liberalisation of party control. Uh, the, 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 there were a number of leader, uh, senior people, not leaders, but senior people in SOEs who were not necessarily party members prior to Tiananmen. That stopped with Tiananmen. And I think GFC, as I've mentioned before, I think raised the, pros raised the issue of, um, of um, uh, is the market the right way to go? Asymmetric risk reward, I think, Chinese leader, uh, leadership in SOEs are punished more for failure than rewarded by success. That's what I tell my wife too. Um, uh, but, and I think that's an important influence on, on decision making. Uh, the, I, I want to go into greater detail on the last three points, the uh, SOEs as an, in, as an in investment, uh, as instruments of national policy and the consolidation and the growth of national champions, because I think these are, are very important today. There's no better example of the SOE financial performance being sacrificed for national interest than, the, than China's 2008 uh, raid on the Rio Tinto share register. Uh, the raid resulted in a, a decision by the State Council to block a proposed merger uh, uh, between Rio uh, Tinto, the number two in global mining, and BHP, um, the world's largest mining company. A particular concern to the um, to the uh, Chinese side was that the merged company would control around one third of the world's iron ore, and at that stage, this was a, a commodity 
that uh, China, China's demand seemed to be insatiable and, and, and had driven up prices by a factor of seven or eight. Um, can I go to the next slide for a minute? Oh, uh, next one after that, sorry. This is uh, from an Australian newspaper um, and it shows uh, it was really a bloodletting, the annual, uh, annual negotiations for iron ore. And uh, 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 the Chinese felt that if the, if the two proponents got together, it would be, be their disadvantage. So what they did is they, the NDRC conduct, conducted a beauty parade of potential uh, SOEs who could carry the Chinese flag. There was Shenhua, um, uh, Chinalco, um, uh, went in and pitched how, why they, and Bao Steel, why they should be represent China. Um, the Guernsey, or the, the winner of the performance, was um, uh, Chinalco, whose, whose boss, um, uh, Xiao Yacheng, wanted to grow his own company into a polymetallic global mining company. So he knew all about the industry and he pitched a good story. And as a result of um, his, uh, his argument, he was given buckets of cash and went off to, um, to uh, have what is today st still the largest uh, uh, market share raid in the history of the UK stock market. And he tipped out $14 uh, billion to buy 12% uh, of Rio Tinto. Um, uh, that effectively blocked uh, uh, BHP's move on it, and um, he, uh, 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 the the um, uh, BHP withdrew, and uh, uh, Chalco ended up with a, uh, a loss of about ten million dollars. But China's national interest, and, and and it was probably worth more than ten billion in my calculation, uh, uh, paid off. Um, I want to uh, 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 go a little bit into a, an entity called China National Non-Ferrous Metals Corporation, which was a, a, a large SOE that was created in, in 1982-83 when the new reforming government of China, Deng Xiaoping, wanted to, um, to reform the non-ferrous metals industry. And this was a... Um, a uh, a large SOE that reported to the State Council. Uh, it was very large and it was led by uh, a, 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 a 51-year-old engineer called Fei Swen. And he, before taking up his role as CNNC, he was the um, general manager of a copper mine in China. And during that time, he'd been seconded to uh, a copper mine in New Guinea, Bougainville Copper. Uh, which had been, uh, which was run by a company called CRA. CRA joined with RTZ many years ago to form Rio Tinto. And Faye told me years later when he came back, it was, it was a transformative experience and his, his desire was to build up a company of similar uh, style and stature as the ones he'd seen in Australia, BHP and CRA. Um, and when he, when he came in, he recycled many of his senior managers, including um, uh, um, uh, Shah, who's now head of SASAC, into these, into these companies. And it was a, a great experience for them. Um, and I think it, set, it, it widened the horizons of these guys, so when they look at reform, they've got particular models in, in mind. Um, in, in, uh, when Fei uh, retired, he was replaced by uh, uh, Wu Jiangcheng, who was uh, Deng Xiaoping's son-in-law. Um, um, he was also an engineer, um, China's very technocratic society, and he led uh, CNNC for about 10 years. And it was a, a period that the, the organisation was plagued by massive corruption, and, and Wu was not involved in it, it was just his lax management. And one of them was a, a, a disaster which costs uh, China 100 to 200 million dollars on a uh, uh, misplaced, uh, misjudged uh, uh, punt on the international stock market. As a result of this, uh, we retired, the, the organisation was dissolved and in its place uh, was created on the aluminium side uh, 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 Chalco and uh, Chinalco. Chalco the, the listed company, Chinalco the parent, 
and the parent put into a, a number of assets into the, the listed uh, entity, and Alcoa were invited to take a uh, cornerstone shareholding, an 8% shareholding. Um, they subsequently sold that after a five or six year lockup period and made a handy $1.8 billion profit. Um, I think um, the, the use of a cornerstone investor is less used today by the Chinese than it used to be, but the intention was that if you had a, a large reputable company like Alcoa, other foreign investors would be prepared to, to join in with you uh, and, you, get, uh, and uh, you have no problem on your IPO. What's happened is the Chinese have, have got now more confidence uh, and skill in international markets and I think foreign companies realise there are risks in getting involved with state-owned enterprises in the, in the sense that uh, whilst they may have a seat on the board, which is what Alcoa had, and certain uh, opportunities to join with work with the Chinese, um, it didn't necessarily give them any ability to influence or, or, or benefit from, from the, the operation. Um, one of the, the things, of, uh, uh, one, uh, one aspect of the IPO that's important, and I go back to one, go back one slide please, yeah. Um, I was actually involved in the Chalco IPO. Uh, uh, they uh, got an army of, um, of, of advisors and uh, uh, accountants to collect all the data that was required and to um, uh, file it in the appropriate form for the prospectus. The thing, the culture shock for, for many of the Chinese was that a lot of the information that was being presented would, would previously have been considered state secrets. And, uh, uh, Mr. Guo, who was head of uh, Chalco at the time, said to me, he said, Michael, it's like having a shower in public. And he contrasted it to the very simple process of running a state-owned em enterprise and even a local listing. Uh, Guo was the, the mining engineer who, who ran, uh, who was the first leader of Chalco. Uh, he's now the current minister for uh, public security in China. Um, he came from a very uh, politically powerful family and a very astute businessman. And he, his objective was to set Chalco up as comparable to its global peers, Alcoa and Alcan. And uh, that was the model he worked on. And by and large, he was very successful. He consolidated a lot of the industry uh, at a time when aluminium prices were flat. He, he quintupled the profit and, and increased revenue dramatically. And he was very good. He was replaced, uh, he, he was, uh, uh, there for four or five years and went off to Guangxi province as, uh, uh, as deputy party secretary uh, and then promoted to party secretary and as I say more recently he's come back to Beijing as a minister for public security. He was replaced by uh, Xiao Yacheng who a young 44, engineer, a 44 year old engineer um, who, who had uh, worked in CNNC, had been to Australia uh, uh, under uh, President Fei's uh, um, uh, guidance, but he had a far more ambitious uh, plan than Guo. He wanted to create a polymetallic global conglomerate like Rio or BHP. Um, and he couldn't do it with the listed company uh, f because the shareholders would, uh, would uh, uh, get upset. The shareholders had invested in an aluminium company. He was going to take them into copper, rare earths and all other things. So, so he had to do something and he used use the, uh, the parent company, Chinalco, uh, to, 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 um, to do that. And uh, he started to buy back some of CNNC's old assets. Uh, some, when CNC was broken up, some of the copper uh, assets were given to provincial governments. He bought them back. He also got approval to spend $800 million on a uh, uh, copper mine in Peru. So he was starting to develop the idea of a, uh, of a global in international uh, standing conglomerate. Um, and, but his real chance came when BHP made the move on Rio Tinto. Uh, and as I said, the, the NDRC was very concerned with that, that, uh, that it would raise the price of uh, uh, iron ore. And uh, uh, Chinalco was given the flag to carry uh, China's representation in, in, uh, in, in trying to stop it. And it, it, it succeeded, 
in, in its national ambitions, but lost t 10 billion in the, in the process. Um, I, uh, the uh, Shong, uh, shortly after the, he succeeded in stopping the, the BHP bid, was promoted to uh, the State Council where he, he looked at issues like uh, industry restructuring, etc. So here's a guy who had uh, an objective of a global, uh, a Chinese company of global standing moving into uh, to developing further policy at the, at the, at the uh, State Council. Um, he, was, uh, he was replaced uh, by another engineer uh, who ran the company for three or four years and he's now also gone to SASIC, straight into SASIC. I think the biggest change uh, uh, in, in Chalco or Chinalco's history has come about in the last uh, uh, 18 months, two years. Uh, there's been a, a, a new leader, uh, uh, Gi Honglin, who was also an engineer. Nobody gets a job in China unless you're an engineer. Um, and he, rather than coming from directly from industry, he came as mayor of Chengdu. It was effectively a political appointment. All the other leaders of that industry have come from within the industry. And they've left the industry to go to government. Here's something different. And Guy has done the same thing. He's split the role of leadership of, of the listed company with the parent company, which was never done before. Uh, and he's brought in outsiders, uh, 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 politicians, uh, to, to run the company. And, and I see this as a sign of, of what he wants. And a lot of these outsiders that he's brought in have had contact with other aspects of China's non-ferrous metals industry uh, in that they, um, they came from companies which are likely to be merged with Chinalco. And if you look at mergers and consolidations in China, they've tended not to be successful, particularly in the steel industry, where companies have resisted the loss of their, their independence. And what I think is happening here is a very clever approach, is these new leaders who, have, who are coming in have come from the companies that are likely to be taken over. Likely to be taken. I've just got a couple more. Have, have I got much more? Uh, keep going. Okay, okay. Um, I'm getting close to the end. Sorry. Um, I think uh, uh, the national champion vision, uh, which is held by much of China's uh, uh, current leadership, is very different to Zhu Ronji's view, uh, where he, he viewed that the best way to reform the state owned enterprises was to carve them up and let, and, and let them fight each other and uh, become more efficient. Um, I think that the, uh, this view has changed in China. You've got a more nationalistic uh, leadership that want to create national champions and are encouraged by the 2008 meltdown, which the Chinese believe highlighted the fragmented nature of their industry. They believe that the fragmentation has caused a, a super competition which has resulted in excess capacity and has driven down prices, so the SOEs are no longer profitable. Uh, the new generation of, of, of leaders believe that consolidation of firms in the same industry uh, will save this waste of public money. And many senior people in Chalco, many of them who lament the breakup of CNC and see it as a national tragedy because it effectively eroded state-owned non-ferrous metal sector, uh, and in, in, in addition to, to introducing foreign competition. Uh, they, they're concerned and want to rejuvenate that sector. And rejuvenation fits in with the China dream of uh, Xi Jinping, etc. And, um, and the former leaders of Chinalco and Chalco who have gone into state security, head of SASAC, are in powerful positions where they, they can influence that policy. I think it's, uh, uh, in finishing off, it's likely that Beijing wants to col consolidate its non-ferrous metals in uh, interests um, into an effectively a holding company with a number of, of subsidiaries, a number of which will be, will be listed. Those, uh, um, and um, uh, a number of them will be loss-making uh, enterprises, but they will not get rid of the people in, uh, at the moment because the uh, uh, 
they don't want large swathes of unemployed people at this point in time. Um, consolidation will strengthen the government's grip on the economy, but it will also hamper the improvements in economic efficiency that many see as, as contributing to current, China's current economic malaise. Um, because it's opposed to large-scale uh, retrenchment of employees, stronger government involvement uh, will slow productivity improvements that are required to rationalise excess capacity. Uh, but I think rationalisation of capacity is secondary to consolidation and, um, and making the various state-owned entities um, merging together will be a task in itself and a closure of capacity will just make that far more difficult. Um, and after all, the reforms are about creating a national champions that can match it with global peers. And in this way, China seems to be returning to an, an earlier period when, when entities like uh, CNNC were seen to be big and beautiful. Thank you. Michael, that was a terrific uh, presentation uh, that could have been labeled back to the future uh, in, in, in many ways, um, but uh, super helpful in some ways, consistent with some things that we've been hearing uh, and seeing, and also uh, some, some new ways, uh, counterintuitive things as well, and the points that you made uh, about the changes in leadership and et cetera is all uh, extremely uh, rich. Uh, we're now going to turn to the commentary portion of the program, and we're, I'm delighted uh, to have uh, three excellent commentators who are going to uh, talk about SOE reform from three uh, different perspectives. First, we're going to have uh, David Dollar, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, uh, uh, an economist there who focuses on China's domestic and global economy. From 2009 to 2013, he was with the tre U.S. Treasury Department their senior uh, person in Beijing. Uh, and before that, he worked for 20 years at the World Bank, including from 2004 to 2009 as their uh, country director in China. Uh, to his left is Hugh McKay, who's the vice president of market analysis and economics at BHP Billiton. He traveled the shortest distance to get here today, only coming from Singapore. And of course, that's why he was on time. Um, <laughs> Uh, before uh, joining BHP Billiton, he was the executive director and senior international economist at Westpac, and before that, a principal advisor of financial markets with the Australian Federal Treasury. Uh, and to his left is my colleague, Sarah Ladislaw, who is the director of the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. Uh, she has uh, terrific expertise on climate change, uh, the electricity markets, and technological change uh, in energy. Uh, prior, prior to joining CSIS, she was with the Department of Energy's Office of the Americas. Uh, so they're each going to talk about different components of the SOE issue and its implications. Uh, David's going to uh, give us a broader view, macroeconomic view. Uh, Hugh is going to look at things from an industrial perspective in different markets. And then Sarah is going to talk, uh, 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 do cleanup in, uh, literally and figuratively by looking uh, at this from the energy sector and from the, the perspective of climate change as well. So let me turn things over to David. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. Great pleasure to be here. So I've been asked to say a few words about the effect of state enterprises and state enterprise reform on China's macro economy. And so let me briefly add four points to the discussion. You know, first, there's a lot of micro evidence in China that state enterprises are less productive and less profitable than private enterprises. And this follows very naturally from what Michael was talking about. If you have partly a commercial objective and then other objectives, naturally you're not going to be as profitable or as productive as, as private firms. Now there are a lot of different state enterprises in China, but in the interest of simplicity, think of two big pools. There's quite a few state enterprises in heavy industry, so 
aluminum would be an example, coal mining, steel production. There are lots of state enterprises in heavy industry. But state enterprises are actually even more prevalent in the modern service sectors. You know, so a lot of the names we think of, the big four Chinese commercial banks, the insurance companies, telecom, logistics, media, airlines, actually state enterprises are dominant in the modern service sectors. Now, a lot of manufacturing in China, other than heavy industry, is private. And you've probably seen these statistics that most of China's exports come from foreign invested firms, which are private. Uh, but there's been interesting recent research that the value added in exports comes primarily from the domestic private sector. So China has this large, productive domestic private sector. And that export-oriented strategy enabled that private sector to expand its share of the economy. So China's rapid growth period had a lot of total factor productivity growth as the private sector expanded its share of the economy. Unfortunately, that's come to an end. Around the time of the global crisis, the whole notion of, of China's exports expanding much more rapidly than GDP, that came to an end, partly because of the crisis. But now China faces the problem that it's the largest exporter in the world, and its exports are not going to grow much faster than the world market. So exports are now a lagging sector in China. And since the crisis, China's relied a lot more on beefing up investment, which stimulates the heavy industry. And then also you've heard about this, this importance of China shifting more to consumption-based demand. Well, consumption is mostly services, and those modern service sectors are dominated by state enterprises. So China really faces this problem now that its kind of natural growth path is taking resources into these low productivity sectors dominated by state enterprises. So second point uh, is, is looking forward, you know, there's a real risk. A lot of these heavy industrial firms uh, have taken on a lot of debt, built up excess capacity as Michael described. So now you've got a lot of zombie firms, state enterprises in heavy industrial sectors that really need to be closed. And then also you've got these expanding service sectors that are dominated by state enterprises. So there is a risk you know, that this pattern of growth now is going to be dragging down productivity growth. We already see that in the aggregate data, dragging down China's growth rate. Just third, very briefly, it's always easy to be the economist saying, what do you need to do? I think what they need to do is clear. They should let a lot of these zombie firms go bankrupt. You know, I, they, if they want to do this through consolidation, that's fine. If the end result uh, is closing a lot of capacity and streamlining things, you know, I sympathize with the concern about the workers in the communities. So it's always important to have adjustment assistance for the workers in the communities. But keeping dead firms alive is not an efficient way of preserving jobs. And then I think a more important issue is they really need to open up those service sectors, which tend to be very closed. China is the most closed of the G20 economies in these sectors like financial services, telecom, all the modern service sectors that I mentioned. So if you really want to get better performance, you know, privatization would be the ideal solution. But as a first step, just opening up those sectors to international competition, that would generate more productivity growth. And then the last point is, I'm not politically naive. If you ask me, do I expect China to aggressively pursue that kind of agenda, I don't see any evidence that we're going to get a lot of reform in the next couple of years. Uh, and that creates this risk that China's economy will keep slowing down because it's depending more on these sectors where state enterprises continue to be a drag on the economy. Thank you. Terrific. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, we'll turn now to uh, Hugh. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm actually going to go a little bit um, off topic from my prepared remarks based on what I've uh, already heard today. Uh, and it comes back to uh, Michael's characterization of there being two you know, very important inflection points in SOE history uh, and singling out uh, Tiananmen and the global financial crisis. I don't think a, an historian of uh, Chinese reform would necessarily pick those two points specifically looking at state-owned enterprises. I think uh, a more conventional position is to say that the 1980s was a time of uh, reform without losers, uh, which was a time of uh, relatively timid uh, 
experimentation in terms of what might work, what might not work. But as an overriding rule, in the 1980s, we didn't get privatisation, we got uh, a reduction in barriers to entry from the private sector to compete in areas where the state-owned enterprise sector was dominant. And China moved forward in fits and starts under that environment, and Tiananmen was obviously a massive political schism, uh, and ultimately it led to the Southern Tour and a re rebirth of uh, entrepreneurial uh, externally focused uh, growth driven by international competitiveness. But at the same time, the 1990s began to see reform with losers, very, very clear losers, tens of millions of unemployed former state-owned enterprise employees and privatisation en masse. So a very, very different uh, backdrop for SOE reform. And Really, it was the uh, reforms that were made in the 1990s that made the 2000s possible. Clean up of bank balance sheets, a streamlining of the state owned enterprise sector, uh, with the most productive assets ending up in private enterprise through asset stripping, as Michael indicated. Uh, and there was also the very, very uh, important issue of privatising uh, real estate development in the late 1990s. And that was actually the major force for growth over the course of the 2000s uh, alongside WTO and the international competitiveness disciplines uh, which came with that. But here we find ourselves uh, post-financial crisis uh, and the stimulus package certainly did uh, underline the role of uh, large SOEs uh, and SOBs, i.e. state-owned banks, uh, not, the, uh, not the Western acronym, uh, and uh, we're now facing another reform drive and it seems as if it's more 1980s than 1990s. It's reform with entry uh, from the private sector but it is not privatisation uh, to actually take away uh, that, com that strong position at the commanding heights. And David's point that there's a lot of evidence that SOEs are less productive and less profitable than their private sector counterparts is true, where there is a relative balance within the sector. But if you look at the return on assets by sector and you scale it by the proportion of state ownership by sector, there is actually a positive relationship on that scatter plot because there are extraordinarily, extraordinarily large rents which are extracted in one pocket of the economy where the big centrally owned SOEs reside. And that's really the only highly profitable part of the system because everything else is so atomistic, fragmented and competitive, margins are actually very, very weak. And that brings me to my final point. There is a very, very big difference between the, the Chalco slash Chin Alcos of the world and the TVEs, the township and village enterprises, uh, which are very much uh, uncompetitive, uh, those that are focused on domestic demand. And it's really there where the huge full employment challenge actually lies for the government. And that's why we're getting the more timid approach, which is allow entry, but let's not actually privatise and let's underline our national champions, but we do need some reform at the TVE end of the spectrum. And that is the segue back into my original notes uh, and representing a diversified resources company, uh, I really should say a little uh, about resources right now. So 2016, there is a very, very clear reform program uh, in play for the coal industry. Obviously, this is a pillar of China's energy supply. You get just less than two-thirds of uh, primary energy in China from coal. That number is going down uh, in the plan. It's to uh, hit 60% by 2020. It's to hit 50% by 2030. Yet China has a huge amount of employment bound up in the coal industry and a lot of sunk capital in that particular sector. But we do now have a very strong microeconomic plan to close smaller mines, uh, to, re to actually retire one billion tonnes of capacity over three to five years. 
you know, we throw a billion and trillion around a lot in finance, but I can tell you in coal, one billion tonnes is a huge, huge slab of the global market. And China is 50% of the global market. So that is no trivial number. Uh, there is a move to shorten the, uh, the number of work days per year in the mines from 330 days, you know, not many days off there, to 276, which is actually basically a standard Monday to Friday white collar uh, workload uh, in a Western country. So that is a dramatic shift and we're actually seeing that the bigger coal companies are actually uh, saying they're going to follow these uh, prescriptions and uh, we'll see how well it works uh, at the lower levels. And there's also a lot of deregulation going on in other areas of the energy space and a lot of this is actually coming back to the basic theme of allowing private competition in these previously exclusive fiefdoms of the central SOEs. And a final point on energy. Uh, when we actually think about China's overall energy mix and how SOE reform comes into that, you have to talk about renewables and you have to talk about uh, disruptive technology, electric vehicles being among them. These are areas where uh, entrepreneurial flair is critical uh, and we are seeing considerable private sector activity in these areas and that is the fastest growing aspect of, of Chinese energy. Don't get too caught up in you know, coal to gas switching, that's a real thing. The bigger factor is renewables outcompeting both of those fossil fuels and uh, really uh, being put up in lights and this actually comes back to, in a way, the hardware advantages that China has in those sectors, particularly in solar panels, but also in, in the uh, infrastructure for wind power that comes with it. And at that point, I will hand to Sarah. Sure. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to pick up uh, on a couple things that Michael said that I thought were really important in his presentation and then maybe just give a little overview of, not go through the details of climate and energy policy in the 13th five-year plan, but sort of point to the parts that probably matter for understanding how it will affect state-owned enterprises. Uh, and, and quite frankly, maybe something else we can get to, which is how companies outside of China can deal with being in China in this new environment. I, I thought two things were particularly interesting. One was this perspective that state owned enterprise reform is sort of an ongoing process uh, that that has you know sort of uh, different inflection points over time, but that one of the core objectives is to make them globally competitive, and how quite difficult that has been. Uh, given the changing nature of the global energy landscape over that period of time. Uh, and so uh, it's really important to understand and appreciate China as both a driver of that change and a reactor to that change, right? So they have to sort of understand how their companies and both on the sort of uh, uh, mineral side and on the uh, energy side across the board are, uh, are shaping markets but also being participants in markets. And I think that that's a very complex field uh, to understand. And so understanding that one of the objectives that is core within the 13th five-year plan and can be understood about the nature of the SOE reform process over a period of time is to make these companies competitive in one way, shape, or form uh, is really uh, uh, important to sort of understanding um, uh, uh, the way in which they might ultimately get reformed. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why I, I want to link that to something else that Michael said, which is um, that we have this idea that as China develops along a development path, they will become more like us. And it's really uh, uh, funny. I don't think it means we'll all become like them, but it is really important to think about the aspect of the energy and climate dialogue that is becoming more like China than like us. Uh, and I I think it's one of the things that uh, that that has been really interesting for me over the course of the last several years is that to the extent that China has been able to get on board with certain approaches to the global climate movement, right? So this idea that you're not going to have a top-down structure that's going to mandate everything that everybody is going to do globally, but you're instead going to put very much like the five-year, uh, 13th five-year plan and the five-year plan process, everybody's going to put forward what they think is achievable, and then you're going to continually revisit it. And it's a, it's a, 
it's quite ironic because this is kind of an idea that came from uh, the Japanese, which is the Cool Earth 50 plan, which I don't know if anyone in the climate community probably remembers this at one point in time, which is everybody sort of put forward your best effort and then see if you can achieve it and then sort of strive to over, you know, do better over time. We're not calling it that in this context, but we certainly are sort of pursuing that goal and it is something that you see within the context of the Chinese plan. If you look at the sort of you know Chinese 13th five-year plan and the sort of Chinese uh, climate commitments, you certainly see this kind of incrementalism. And I would say uh, one of the things that you see in the in the in the plan itself is that the the changes are in terms of stringency, in terms of scope, and in terms of importance. And I think that that's really interesting. So in terms of stringency, like I said, it's not that the Chinese have laid out a bunch of targets, whether it's carbon intensity or their overall use of energy or the share. I think some of the shares of particular fuels within the fuel mix are relatively ambitious. But they're not things that people as a whole think the Chinese economy can't achieve if it achieves its fundamental objective, which is economic reform, right, which is moving more towards a service-based economy. And so I think this idea that, you know, many people criticize the Chinese plan as being not uh, 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 ambitious enough, while other people criticize it for being way too ambitious, well, it, it depends on what part of the plan you're talking about. And, and this becomes more tricky to follow in the 13th five-year plan because it's so much more a part of the plan, right? This idea, and I think, Scott, what was the name of your, your 13 five-year plan report that you just put out? Um, Perfecting China Inc. Yeah, so it really helpfully, uh, sorry, there's a plug, right? Uh, uh, it really helpfully outlines the way in which environmental objectives and climate change objectives, both thematically and in terms of mandatory goals, are really important within this 13th five-year plan. And I think if you add the focus not only just on environmental priorities, local pollution priorities, climate change oriented priorities, but also couple in much of what's in the science and technology aspect of the of the 13 five year plan, which is also geared towards dealing with climate change uh, or dealing with local pollution issues and being competitive in terms of a contributor to a solution to those challenges. I think you really get the idea that China is trying to be competitive and try to trying to make these markets, both at home and abroad, because if you can make some of these uh, climate change uh, oriented uh, changes at home, both in terms of growing a, a market for solar, growing a market for wind, being able to uh, 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 deploy some of these technologies, these high efficiency technologies, you can improve upon them, you can drive the cost down, and then you can sell them elsewhere. And I think that's a huge part uh, of the strategy, and it leads to a question of, of how companies who want to have a role in China, maybe not competing with the companies that are going to be protected in, you know, for, for a host of political reasons, but looking for a way to be part of some of that science, science and technology endeavor. I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is BHP's recent announcement that you guys are going to work with Peking University on uh, carbon capture and, and utilization in industrial applications, right? That's something that's not been done in a lot of places. China probably wants to, you know, be aware of that and participate in that. That may be an easier place for external companies to get involved in China rather than, you know, in, in some of the more sort of traditional ways that Michael talked about before. I think lastly, uh, it's really important to, to understand that some of the same things that have plagued Chinese energy and economic policy making before uh, are, are, are very similar from a climate change perspective, right? I mean, the, the enforcement of the actions, uh, the ability to follow through on some of them. And one of the things I'd like to put, you know, before people thinking about whether or not China is going to be able to go beyond what they've pledged to do in 2020 or 2030, and whether or not how they're going to structure their economy to achieve those ends, the reality in a climate change space is we literally have no idea how to deliver on those really deep carbon emissions that are required in a post-2030, 2040, 2050 uh, uh, type uh, uh, of environment. Those are very, very deep emissions reductions. It's going to take a, perhaps a new and different approach, both from a, a company perspective and from a climate policy perspective. and and. And, and I think China is starting to try and, and figure out how they're going to approach that kind of change, how they can be competitive in that world. So 
it really from a climate change perspective, it does require looking even beyond 2030 to understand where they might be, you know, where, the, you know, in a hockey terminology, where they're skating towards the puck, right? And I think that that's really important to understand when you start to see them doing additionally interesting things, not in, you know, the commodity market space, but in sort of the creation of a green bond market, right? Or in the creation of cap and trade programs. Ca effective cap and trade programs in a non-market based economy, that's quite a trick. We'll see if it works. Th those kinds of things are going to be really important innovations for the global climate story, even more so than just sort of, you know, China's economic reform perspective, so. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, three excellent commentaries. I guess I'd, I'd sum them up uh, by saying that the, David and Hugh were, were identifying the challenges of SOE reform, but also the variation amongst SOEs. Uh, to some extent, it's by sector. To some extent, it's central versus local, uh, which means how you tackle things depends on actually which SOEs you're, you're discussing. Um, and I think the point that I draw from Sarah's comments are, are that what may be good for SOE reform may not be good for hitting environmental targets or the type of state approach that China uses uh, to achieve public good ends, which aren't necessarily related to efficiencies, uh, that's one approach, but the discussion particularly that, that came out of David and Michael's remarks was, you know, achieving efficiency means definitely using market tools, uh, but this is a political economy where that's not necessarily the preferred approach. So it's good. Not it means not all good things come, go together necessarily, perhaps. I want to give Michael a chance to respond to the initial comments, and then we'll uh, turn to the floor. On the... Um uh, David's comments regarding the variations ac across sectors and, and, and um, Hugh's comment about the geographic dispersion. And it reminded me as, as I were talking, there's the old story about the generals fighting the last war. And I think in many ways the problems in China's SOE sectors are less in the new economy items like uh, airlines, electricity, telecoms, etc., and they're more in the heavy industry sector. And that heavy industry sector was once deemed national priorities. You know, uh, it was a national priority to create uh, an aluminium industry, to create a steel industry. And these guys were coaxed along and given a uh, mollycoddled along, giving privileged access to uh, essential key resources, etc. Not just money, but there was other things um, which led them to grow. And they saw, th and they were inculcated with the national good they were doing. These guys are now at the top of the, the, the pole and they're required to, do the, to now implement reforms and come up with ideas and they're thinking more toward the old industries that they came from than the new industries which have got problems for, for, for modern economies. You know, Australia, for example, has, has, has debated uh, uh, telecoms and electricity, how, how they should be structured and it wasn't that long ago that they were all state monopolies. So I, I just think that there's that, that point about it is, is the, the people concerned. And I think um, uh, David's comment about the best way, it's not going to happen, but, uh, uh, but the best way is to open up the sectors. And in some ways that happened with aluminium. Uh, Chalco used to be the largest producer of aluminium in China. Now it's not. And in fact, the largest producer in China is a privately owned company called Hongqiao, which is the largest producer in the world. It's, it's Trump the Russians. And, and, and when you look and compare Chalco with Hongqiao, Chalco's, uh, uh, Hongqiao's productivity is, I think, seven times better. It, it produces, um, for every tonne of aluminium, it takes one-seventh of the people that Chalco takes. And the, the structure, the, uh, I think uh, there's a similar gap between leadership positions and shop floor positions. There are far more executives... Um, uh, or as they call them, where I come from, ties in on the on, uh, than shop floor people, and I think it, there are some very simple benchmarking between the private and the state could could go a long way. That's all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to turn things over to the audience now. Uh, in typical CSIS tradition, uh, please identify yourself. Uh, keep your question relatively limited and identify. Uh, whether your question is directed to Michael or one of the other panelists. We'll start right here. And so microphone is coming your way. Thank you. I'm Peter Bottelier. 
no current affiliation to old. Uh, my question is mostly for Mr. Komasarov. It seems to me, listening to you and also to the other presentations, that China has never really solved their SOE problem from an ideological perspective. For a while, it seemed, in the late 90s under Churanji, that they were going to. Now, my question is a two-part question. What went wrong? Why did we all think in 99 and the early 2000s that China was on the way to solving this fundamental ideological problem and come up with an efficient state enterprise sector? What went wrong? And secondly, if we had today Mr. Churonji in charge of the economy, he is, he is still a young man, he is in his 80s, he is in Shanghai, is he privately happy that he is not in charge, or are his fingers itching to do something that the current leadership is not? Look, I think you've hit the nail on the head. There's never been any great accept uh, ideological acceptance of the reform of SOEs. And if you go back to Xi Rongji's time, he, I think he referred to the fact that there was a coffin waiting in his office to be, that he was gonna be carried out on because of the opposition he was, he was going to encounter. Uh, and so I think you've hit the nail on the head. Some of the work that, the work that I've done uh, through SOEs, um, for things to happen, you need a, politi a, well, a politically connected champion to get you through. I've seen SOEs uh, give up uh, profitable business opportunities because they weren't supported by uh, a political champion with a credibility. And in some ways, uh, the Rio, uh, Rio Tinto Chinelco move um, it failed in the end, and I didn't go through the whole case study, but there was a, a second version of it where uh, Chinalco came up and offered Rio Tinto uh, preferential shares, uh, a, a pref pref preferential bonds, which could be converted into shares, and uh, a, a, a deal of um, uh, joint ventures in some of Rio's assets. They were put up... Um, Rio initially accepted them and then started to back away and they were talking about it and, and the uh, Chinese uh, said no. And when I talk to my colleagues in China, uh, in Chalco, uh, Chinalco, and they say it was really his, his, uh, his uh, replacement, Guo, who didn't want to do it. Uh, what, he, uh, what he said in, privately within the, uh, the confines of, uh, of their meetings, he said, you know, for years, uh, the, America, the, the West uh, have blamed us for, for welching. Oh, that's an Australian term. I don't know if you understand it. Um, uh, 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 walking away from deals, uh, uh, shaking hands, then walking away. He said, they've accused us for doing it, and now they're doing it to us. We shouldn't, shouldn't accept it. And the view was there were some compromises on the table. They weren't as good as the, the, the first deal, but he could get them through. And he chose not to because his career, it was, uh, the, the big deal was underwater. Uh, he didn't want to take it on. I can give you a, a, a one other example of a, of a similar thing where political patronage was important. I was involved in a transaction um, back in the early 90s where effectively CNNC took a leveraged lease on certain production assets that Alcoa had. So fundamentally, they gave them a, a contribution to the capital and in return for that capital, they got, they got um, product out at cost. Um, my, it was the first time the Chinese had ever done a long-term resource deal of that nature, supply deal. My calculation, and it, was a, a, it started off at 400,000 tonnes and went to a million. My, uh, uh, by 2004, when all the options to expand had, um, had expired, China had made, on my calculations, $80 million more than it would have done had it done its normal process, which is a, a reasonable slab of money over four years by that time, four or five years. And I, I went to ask my Chinese, Chinese friends, why didn't you ever exercise the options? And they said, the first deal was done by Mr Wu, who's Deng's son-in-law, and whatever he said went. There was no rigorous economic analysis. The boss said it, and we all did it, and the state council signed off on it. When he left, uh, because of all the corruption going on around it, nobody wanted to be associated with it, even though it was a profitable deal. And I think, so, so I think, you know, if Gironji was, you need a Gironji there today, who's going to say, you know, get the six coffins lined up for me, because I'm going to do it. Thank you.
Terrific, terrific. Yeah. Yes, right here. And then we'll go to David. Uh, hi, my name is Cameron Vesca. I'm an intern at the Foreign Services, excuse me, Foreign Service Institute at the Department of State, um, and I'm interested in the sort of the trilateral interaction between what some uh, experts in geopolitics and geopolitical economy are calling the new developing G3 arrangement of the world, which would be the constellation of interests in Europe, um, no pun intended, um, and the U.S. and and China. Do you think the SOEs and and the Chinese economy are going to have extra leverage because of the, the political um, arrangement there? Um, or is their lack of efficiency going to, to hinder them in, in sort of playing the playing off Europe and, and the US against each other um, in the different uh, trade agreements and, and interests there? Look, I, I don't have an opinion on it. Uh, so there's some potential for China to play the United States and the European Union off. Uh, you know, China's negotiating bilateral investment treaties with each. China's interested in getting market economy status as having different discussions with each. But, you know, my perception is that up till now, the U.S. and the EU have hung together pretty well, in, in partly because their positions are based on certain principles. Uh, and so I think that, uh, and we're negotiating the uh, transatlantic partnership, TTIP, and you've got deep bonds between the United States and Europe. So I think it's kind of an interesting geopolitical issue. There's a little potential advantage for China, but I think those, those fundamental uh, foundations of transatlantic relationships are quite strong. I'm going to go in the fifth row, David. Yes. Uh, David Brown from SICE. Uh, the question of the BIT has come up, and my question is, what does the negative list, what's on it and what's not on it, uh, tell us about the prospects for state-owned enterprise reform in China? Well, I, think, I, I don't think anyone's leaked the list. Um, but my sense is, that as we where we stand as of right now, is that the you know the Chinese offer still includes a very large number of sectors. If I had to guess, I would guess somewhere towards a hundred. Uh, but Deputy Premier Wang Yang said that China would be coming with a new offer next week, uh, and so you know so it's always nice to remain hopeful that that China will come with a dramatically shortened list of you know maybe 25 sectors or so, which would still be a tough negotiation. And I'm just. I'm making up those numbers. I'm just sort of thinking logically. I, I guess I'm skeptical within the context of Chinese politics that they're they're actually going to come with a really good offer next week, and it probably won't be leaked because that's the nature of serious negotiations. But uh, we'll see. I would just uh, just second that from what I've heard. Um, yes, they'll come next week. I don't know if the United States will take yes for an answer, even if it was an extremely short list, uh, given the political climate in the United States right now and the emphasis on getting TPP through. Uh, but it's certainly useful. So I still think these are early days for those negotiations that will uh, most likely um, end up in the next administration's uh, negotiation inbox as opposed to being completed before the Pre Obama administration completes its term. Sure. That means that the prospects for state-owned enterprise reform are really quite limited because the negative list is likely to be quite long. Is that correct? I w um, to the extent that SOE reform can be encouraged using foreign pressure a la WTO and making the bit play that kind of role, I would agree that, that it won't there's little likelihood that it'll serve that function in the very short term. So it's going to be needing to have other resources uh, pushing it, which is, has to do with the, the debt challenges, the recognition of the problems, technological improvements, or uh, you know, a different local dynamic in the political economy within China. I think it's the second row here and then. Uh, I am Dharmendra Chaudhary. I am an, an anti-dumping attorney here, and uh, our practice is focused on China. So, my question is that, as you know, these days uh, the uh, market economy's impending status, uh, which should kick in, but will, but perhaps won't on December 11 of 2016. Now, 
the main issue is stumbling block is that here Department of Commerce has a six factor scale and some of them are macro scales like whether China allows free investment, whether the fixation of wage in China is market determined or is it, it is, or is it not market determined. But a major component of the, the remaining three, four points, they revolve around this, essentially around SOE reforms. And you know, in anti-dumping, the main allegation is that goods are being exported from China at less than the fair market value of goods. In the context of exports by SOE, the main allegation is that it is not a private individual who is controlling the export price in China, but, but government appointed uh, officials by SESA. So if I were to ask if, if you have to advocate uh, a position uh, in support of China's market economy status, what argument would you adduce in support that China has made a lot of SOE reforms specific to this transition, you know, which, which can support the transition of China from non-market non economy to market economy? And I want some very specific answers, such as, how much SASAC has reduced its control in terms of appointment of officials to individual SOE enterprises? How much uh, more managerial control and managers not appointed by SASAC are in control of determination of export price of goods like these? An excellent question from what sounds like a law professor, not just a lawyer. Uh, uh, I think um, welcome uh, comments on what China's economy looks like uh, through the prism of, of SOEs and this question about marketization? Look, in, in the metallurgical industries, and again, I'll use aluminium as an example, there is a transparent market, the Shanghai Metals Exchange, um, which, which is similar to the London Metal Exchange. It's got a little bit more restrictions in terms of daily price movements, but there's no doubt it's a free market measurement of, uh, of the price of the metals, and a lot of the other metals like copper have, and, and steel have similar, similar, similar trading. So I would suspect it's a simple matter of looking at the, at the trend, trend on, those, uh, on, that, on those exchanges. Now, there's a lot of work being done on the uh, difference between the London Metal Exchange, which people readily accept as a free market, and, and the Shanghai exchanges. And the, the difference between them are usually explained by logistic factors. Uh, or tariffs. Um, so my view is that with, within, within the pricing of the raw materials and the finished products, they're basically at, at free market prices. Now, a lot of free market prices are down because there's so much excess supply. And what people don't realise is how many Chinese companies uh, have uh, been able to adapt to the lower prices. Um, Aluminium, again, I, I hark back to it as one I know a lot more than, than, than most, um, never ever had the boom. You know, copper prices went up by a factor of seven, uh, iron ore prices by a factor of nine, alley prices I think went up by one and a half. It never had a boom and it's less today than it was 30 years ago. Um, but Chinese companies uh, have been able to adapt and one of the reasons they've been able to adapt is they don't have the long-term commitments that Western companies have. A Western aluminium smelter, one of its barriers to exit is probably got a very large power contract with a utility. So it's got to, it's got to negotiate with that utility to get rid of it. To get rid of, That doesn't happen in China because there is enough other people wanting to grab the power or it's self-generated. So in, ter in terms of pricing, my view is that they're basically international pricing. Yeah, so just building on that point, the, the goods market or the commodities market inside China has been market driven for a long period of time. What hasn't been market driven is the factors of production. That's where we still have considerable distortions. So land, labour, capital, energy, uh, the environment is sort of an external, external diseconomy that isn't really priced yet. So, but they're not alone there. You know, uh, energy prices are subsidised to some degree in probably the majority of the countries of the world, uh, and there are rigidities in multiple areas. Uh, but China is much closer to having uh, a deregulated overall factor price than they were 
you know, uh, than they were 10 years ago. There's been a lot of effort uh, in that regard. But if you really want some, uh, you know, granular detail on this, just walk around to a few of the embassies because uh, many, many countries have granted China market economy status in their own bilateral negotiations and that is a, something that the Chinese asked for at the outset before they'd start talking. So see what arguments they came up with and uh, you'll, be, you'll have a very good list. Okay, I think we have, have time for at least one more question here. The second, third. Thank you. My name is Molly Reiner. Uh, my question is about the uh, motivation to create global champions um, out of SOEs. And it seems that one of the, I guess, side effects or consequences of becoming a global champion is acquiring American companies investing in the United States. But that is inher like, inherently difficult with SOE status, um, subject to different government regulations. So what is the balance, um, and is there any motivation for the Chinese government to reform to make that acquisition process easier, um, make that development into global champion easier? In terms of acquisition of, of foreign entities? Well, I would say in the United States, there's a lot of noise around some of the Chinese acquisitions, and there is a Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States that looks at national security implications. But if you actually look at what happens, it's only a tiny number of transactions that are reviewed by CFIUS. There were about 20 Chinese tra transactions reviewed last year, for example. There are very, very few examples that of transactions that have been stopped. So I think objectively, the United States is very open. There's an enormous amount of Chinese investment coming in. There's Chinese state enterprises buying all kinds of stuff in the United States. And in fact, it's, it's a growing issue for the United States because U.S. firms cannot go to China make acquisitions in the same sectors. And so there's an unfairness there. But for the moment, the state enterprise status of Chinese firms is not stopping them from actually coming into the U.S. and making a lot of acquisitions. Could I say the, the same thing effectively applies in Australia? Um, and I go back to the Rio Tinto case I described before. The Australia's Foreign Investment Review Board didn't need to rule on this case. It was considering it. But the, the deal broke up beforehand, and Rio Tinto paid a $190 million break-up fee to uh, Chinalco for it. Um, I think in terms of the mineral sector, the only case that I know where... Uh, there, there were two cases where the Australian government refused Chinese participation in a, in a mineral project. One was when uh, they wanted to buy a company called Oz Minerals. Oz Minerals um, had a copper deposit um, close by a, a, a government missile testing range. And, and the government said, look, you can buy the company, but that's got to be excised. Um, and then the, the other case was uh, there's a, a rare earth company called Linus, and there was a Chinese rare earth company who wanted to buy Linus, which had a deposit in Australia and was processing in Malaysia. And the Australian government, and it was more the competition regulator, said, you guys control X percent of the market. You're going to take this. You're going to have Y percent. The answer is no. Um, I think the biggest problem for Chinese firms going out is the ability to make decisions and execute the projects that they're talking about. And, you know, there's a very interesting study called um, Sino Iron in, in Western Australia, where um, if you want to look at how a foreign company makes mis can make mistakes, um, that's a classic case. And and a lot, lot of case studies at management school are for Western Australian or American companies going overseas, don't make these mistakes. This is a classic one. And I would go as far as to say the work I've done on, on Chinese overseas investment in the metallurgical sector, there's only two projects that they've ever made money on uh, and they haven't damaged their reputation. And strange enough, both those projects are over 40 years old or 35 years old. Um, and they involve Chinese being a uh, joining up with a large and reputable player as a as a as a sidekick to learn the industry. Hey, I want to th uh, throw out one more question <laughs> and, and start down with with Sarah on this. So one of the seams of the obstacles of SOE reform has to do with. Um, the power of, of SOEs, the political power of them, and their connections to leaders. And uh, one sector that we didn't talk much about is oil. 
and we know that uh, Zhou Yong Kang, uh, the Chinese leader, was brought down, um, and the price of oil is a lot lower than it used to be. Should that give us, if we're looking for sectors where we might look for potential success relative to others for SOE reform, would oil be a, an area where we might expect more success? And, and others can figure, want, if you want to contribute, weigh in as well. But It's a good question. I mean, I think um, one of the, I mean, I don't know that you would, you, you will necessarily see m more reform in the sort of, in the, um, Knox uh, in the oil sector only because I think one of the fundamental things holding that back is th the sheer size of the companies and the employment function that they play. And so we had a conference about this not too long ago. And and one of the, I mean, there's there's two elements that that sort of cause a little bit of difficulty, especially on the upstream side. I think you know there's the in the midstream and the downstream. I think you are seeing a lot of uh, uh, changes, but but not necessarily just from the the SOEs. One is what is the oil market going to look like going forward, and two is what do what does the new strategy of Chinese SOEs look like domestically, and what does it look like internationally? And so there is a question about one how people and uh, who invest in the oil sector are going to be making investments in a lower for longer environment, and where you get good return on those investments and a perception that perhaps Chinese state-owned enterprises bought high and would be loath to sell low, especially after what they've gone through in sort of the, uh, the anti-corruption uh, uh, debate. So there's a lot of room for reform of Chinese SOEs to the extent that the oil market itself is undergoing some fundamental changes. And I think that there is an interest in every aspect of the Chinese energy economy to figure out how to be competitive in that way. But I think that the, one of the things that had been the hallmark of Chinese SOE participation, especially abroad, which is their ability to bring financing, right, and to be able to invest in projects where perhaps there wouldn't have been financing otherwise, is is something that is fundamentally in question going forward, right? So, so I don't know if that makes it more or less likely, but I do know that there's a lot of question about what the future of their um, uh, the, the sort of next strategic leg of Chinese SOE involvement in the oil sector will be going forward. That's super helpful. Um, the purpose of the China Reality Check series uh, is to ask questions about topics which are really important but don't get discussed enough. And not only though did we ask good questions today, I think we also got some excellent answers. Um, but they weren't necessarily the answers that we'd like to hear or the ones that Beijing would like to hear because uh, the, obviously the ch challenges for SOE reform are extremely substantial whether you're looking at political reasons, economic reasons, or, and also China's uh, relationship with the rest of the world. Hugely informative, hugely helpful. Uh, Michael, uh, David, Hugh, Sarah, thank you all very much. Everyone, please join in me in thanking them. Very nice to meet you. No, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs>